1 Corinthians chapter 5 proves the required changed life of a born-again saint. Okay? We're going to look at 10 words or 10 statements, we'll say, of harsh judgment. Okay? And we're going to see these within this chapter, within these 13 verses. Interesting number 13, number of cursing in the Bible. But uh, curses from God, in other words. Number one, you have mourned. Number two, you have taken away. Number three, judged, delivered such an one unto Satan. Destruction is number five. Number six is leaven. Number seven is purge out. Number eight, malice. Number nine, wickedness. And number ten, fornicators. Now we're going to read the chapter and we're going to see these key words here. Okay? Um, if, you have, if you're required to have a changed life, then there will be punishment if you don't. Punishment if you mess around and sin. Okay? We're going to prove that. I'm going to get ahead of myself here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. All right, this is, there's no indication given of this man's name, but one should have his father's wife. Now that's either incest or it's he's fornicating with his stepmother. The Bible doesn't say which one it is. But either way, it's pretty bad. I mean, it'd be worse with incest, but the point is it's a really bad situation. All right? And I mean, just before I go on, uh, it's interesting that this guy's not named, but I'll tell you right now, if he was named, there'd be a whole lot of people that they would, he would be their patron saint. Okay? Every false convert that you will ever run into that you say you have to have a changed life, have you truly repented of your sin? Have you come to the Lord broken, a contrite? Have you been born again? Do you have a new life in Christ Jesus? Every single one of them will run right here to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and say, what about the guy that had you know, his father's wife, committed fornication with his father's wife? What about him? See, he's their patron saint. Okay? Um, that's kind of an interesting thing there. Verse 2, And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned, number one, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Stop. Um, well, you know what? All of us are sinners. We're all sinners. We all believe that Jesus died for our sins, and we're all Christians. And, and you know what? Who am I to judge you? Because you see, yes, you might have done this bad thing, but I have done bad things too. I still struggle with sin. We all still struggle with sin. So, you know, the, the place for you is not out there in the world. It's in here with the church. So we really don't want to, you know, judge you. I, I'm not going to judge you. I'm a sinner too. Let him that's without sin cast the first stone. That's what the Corinthians are doing. That's what's going on there. Just like a lot of the people out there, these wicked people. There's some guy that fornicates with his father's wife and they say, well, he makes the right profession of faith and everything else and stuff. And in context, this guy is saved. But look what happens. Paul doesn't say, hey, you know what? He's born again. He's just a carnal Christian. So let's just kind of, you know, yeah, we, we should talk to him and we maybe want to disfellowship with him for a little bit. But we're all sinners. Let's just, you know, kind of overlook. Paul doesn't say that. He says, you haven't mourned. You know, you should mourn when a Christian, a saved brother or sister does something very wicked. And then you should be busy taking them away. Kick them out. Get out of here. You don't belong with us. Hmm. Change life is required. We'll see that later. Verse 2. And ye are puffed up and have not rather... We already went over that one. Verse 3. Excuse me. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when ye are gathered together with my spirit with the power and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh destruction 
that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. There you go. That's proof that he was saved. The Spirit saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This guy was a saved man, but he did something so wickedly. And Paul didn't say, well, you know, it's uh, just kind of... Uh, I mean, think about this. Let's bring this to our modern day. Hey, some guy comes along and he's looking at pornography or whatever else and he gets caught for it and, and things and whatever. And, and don't give me this thing of, well, you know, it was just because of the, he was with his father's wife and that was extra wicked. But there's other things that are condemned in Scripture and that's not as bad or whatever. No, Paul's condemning fornicators in this thing. So let's say some guy's looking at pornography and he goes and he steps out on his wife or he goes out and he commits fornication. Uh, you know what the, the thing is here that Paul tells the Corinthian believers to do? Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Oh, brother and I kind of sinned and I went and I committed fornication. Okay, get out of here. You're not going to have fellowship with anymore and I hope the devil kills you. How many churches do that? Hmm. Kick him out and let's pray that the devil kills him. Destruction of the flesh. What do you think that means? Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And a changed life isn't required for all you wicked heretics out there. No standards after you get saved. You can. You don't have to. You should. You should live kind of holy and righteous and stuff. I mean, that stuff is in there and, you know, sanctification and separation and standards of whatever. You can, but you don't really need to. And If that's the case, then why is Paul making such a big deal about this? Kick him out. Let's pray that the devil kills him. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, number six, leaveneth the whole lump? You know what happens when you allow a wicked fornicator like that into be in your midst there? Well, he's a saved brother. He's my brother in Christ, and I don't want to judge him. I mean, he made a bad mistake and whatever else. Guess what? He's getting away with this. They didn't kick him out. Maybe I can get away with this. Maybe I can do that. And all of a sudden, everything starts to fall apart. The church of the living God is supposed to be a judging church. You see somebody messing around and sin like that and open fornication and whatever else, we'll get into some of the sins here coming up. Kick them out. Taken away. You're leaven. Look at Think about that. Some of these wicked people, you find out that they're being wicked and whatever else, and you say, I'll part in company with you and whatever. Just go up to them and say, you're 11. Get out of my sight, and I hope the devil kills you. That's what Paul's doing. Oh, there's no change life required. And whatever. Oh, oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is, and there's a great punishment if you truly are saved, if you're truly born again, there's a great punishment for those people who put up with sin and who are sinning, I should say, who are sinning and, and who put up with sin as well. But let's continue there, or continue here. Verse 7, purge out therefore, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Purge it out. Kind of an interesting little statement there. Throw him out. Get rid of him. Purge him out. Make an example of him that others also may fear. Verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Oh, how judgmental. Oh, Paul, you're, let him that's without sin cast the first stone, Paul. Are you sinlessly perfect, Brother Paul? Hey, this guy's malice and wickedness. Purge him out. Take him away. Delivered such an one unto Satan. Destroy him. Get him out of here. Get him out of my sight.
but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. We have to deal with lost people out there in public. We have to deal with their wicked music. We have to deal with their wicked ways and their wicked speech and everything else. We have to deal with them. But when it comes to the church of the living God, mm -mm, no, no. You find somebody that's messing around with that stuff, get out. You don't belong here. Well, br but brother, I've, I've been saved and everything. Okay, where's your changed life at? Why'd you go and do this thing? Leaven. You're leaven in the body of Christ. Get out of here and I hope the devil kills you. My, what standards they had. My, what standards we've let slip. Let a lot of people in that don't belong. Hmm. Verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. In the New Testament there, by the way, when they're eating, a lot of times it's coming, they're coming together and eating together and things. I think that's the reference here. Um, but you also look at the thing of uh, if any would not work, neither should he eat. So there's also a tie in there as well. You get some guy that's on welfare or whatever else, and he's not working, and he could physically work. Um, yeah, he, this fellowship. Get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Put him away. Get him out of here. And you're in sin for keeping him around. So we're going to go next to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, but before we go there, just, you know, all this argument about there is no changed life, there's, you know, there are people that are just carnal and whatever else, that's coming predominantly today from lost people. Um, I hate to tell you, but uh, there were Catholics 200 years ago that had better morals and better standards than a lot of the uh, professing brethren of today. Just as simple as that. Um, the most wicked, most evil people out there, uh, by the way, are professing Christians. Don't know if you knew that or not. Satan's ministers appear, appear as the ministers of righteousness, the Bible says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We won't go there for sake of time, but you can look it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, talks about Satan's ministers being transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Bible talks about in perils among false brethren. So there are fake ones, but even some of the ones that are, you know, truly, genuinely born again, they can mess up. But you judge them, and you judge them harshly, because they're not living that new life in Christ Jesus. Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. You're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You get it? But let's go here to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, because I know that the devils will come out and they'll say, well, yeah, but Paul restored the man, you know, and whatever else. He didn't restore him. There's no scripture to prove that. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, um, verse 8 through 12. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He's talking about the first letter that he wrote to him. He ripped them, you know, pretty badly over the thing of this keeping this wicked fornicator in among them. Verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Again, what's the reason for getting rid of somebody like this? Is it harsh and cruel? Yes, it is. But you see, is it going to make the body of Christ stronger or weaker? Stronger. Much stronger. Purge out that old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. You maintain strength within the body of Christ by maintaining standards of righteousness and holiness that are backed up by Scripture. You start to let sinners come in and start to tear things down. Pretty soon, it brings the standards down. It brings And, and you, the church has made shipwreck. You have to purge out there for the old leaven. And what did they do? They repented of what they were doing. They changed. 
Um, verse 10, for, God, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. They realized that they were sinning against God by keeping that fornicator there in their midst. And they kicked him out. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Paul is speaking here not only to them of the fact that they repented for what they did, but also true versus false conversion. How do you know? Keep reading. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. He's contrasting saved people and lost people. Don't act like you're lost by having the sorrow of the world. Oh, we got caught. Oh, you know, whatever. Did you sin against God? Well, no, God knows our hearts. We're good people. We just, you know, no, they sinned against God. They had godly sorrow, all right? Much the same way when you come to the Lord as a broken sinner. Do you have godly sorrow or do you have worldly sorrow? See, big difference there. And what does it prove? Okay, what is the proof that you have godly sorrow? Verse 11, for behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. Behold, this thing here that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, here's the proof that you did it right. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation. Does this indignation here? Yes. Yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. Oh, man, we've been so wrong to have this fornicator in our midst. Hey, get, get out of here. We're going to deliver you unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. We're purging you out of here. Wicked, evil, malice. Just get out of our sight. You don't belong around us. Why? They're making themselves stronger. Verse 12, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong. This fornicator here. Um, nor for his cause that suffered wrong but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Okay? So he's, he's basically saying there, um, I didn't just do this thing to attack this guy and whatever else. No, I did it so you can understand why you need to get rid of this guy, why you need to treat this guy harshly and kick him out. All right? Um, if you see somebody that's sinning, it, and it's, it's tough sometimes. I've had some people that, you know, came along and they're quote-unquote friends of the ministry and I see them involved in sin and I have to rebuke them, you know, and we part company and the whole thing. Why? Well, I don't want my standards being torn down to theirs, to their level. Somebody's a drunkard or whatever else. Sorry. Um, go away. I have to purge out, purge you out of my presence here. Um, somebody's messing around with other things of the world, things that are condemned in Scripture. Sorry. Go away. Um, I'm going to rebuke you for what you're doing. We need to hold our standards high. And this is our standard right here. Um, so this, this whole argument of these, these uh, people that say that it's just this salvation is faith only or it's just believe and all this other stuff. And if somebody's messing around with sin, well, they're just carnal and, and all these things. And then they'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to their little hero, their patron saint, as I said earlier. What about the guy that, you know, was committing fornication with his father's wife? Mm -hmm. He was genuinely saved. And then, see, they're, they're trying to find a bigger hypocrite than themselves so that they can hide behind that hypocrite. So they can say, well, yeah, you know, I, I might get drunk once in a while, but, hey, I, I don't fornicate with my father's wife. Well, you know, I, I might, uh, you know, use a new version once in a while. I might have some Catholic friends. I might go to church, uh, my church building thing there. Uh, I might, you go down through the list. I might do those things there, but uh, I don't fornicate with my father's wife. And it's this whole changed life thing. I reject that. You don't have to have a changed life. You can be like this uh, Brian Welsh, you know, Satanist, whatever. The, you know, he's a, still in the band Corn, satanic band. And uh, he, he says he's been changed by Jesus. And he looks the same. And he's still living the same lost life. Well, he's just carnal. No, he's lost. Okay, uh, he's lost. And you say, well, what if he is truly saved? What if he truly got saved? Then you kick him out because he's doing a bunch of wicked stuff. Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I have had par to part company with people that I think um, were probably saved, but they're wicked. There's malice. There's wickedness. 
and I've had to purge them out of my life because they're taking me, my standards down. I'm finding that I have to compromise the Bible, what the Bible teaches, in order to fellowship with this person. So I have to get them out of my midst. Sorry. I have to purge our relationship. I'm not going to eat with you. Just that simple. So again, uh, part of what I do when I preach and teach the Word of God is I, I understand the arguments of my enemies, and I come out and I preach counter to that so I can teach you how to answer them. Um, that's part of my job. Um, and so don't fall for this, this ridiculous, stupid nonsense that the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, gives you know, some kind of a scriptural grounds for somebody struggling with the sin and whatever else. We all struggle with sin. I get that. Nobody's sinlessly perfect. I get that. But there are standards, brethren. There are some major standards in this book right here. And most people don't follow them. Okay? And I'm talking Pauline epistles. Okay? I'm not talking Old Testament or some. I'm talking what Paul wrote to people that are in the church of the living God. Saved brethren, we have standards that we're supposed to live by. They're there. You say, well, you know, we're not all living by it. Okay, then, you know, I know people that aren't living by those standards. We'll talk to them about it, warn them about it, and if they're just pridefully going to continue, purge out that leaven. And if they're really bad, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You need to judge them. And you need to mourn that you were falling for that sin. You need to fear God and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I cannot believe that I did that. I am, oh, I feel so stupid. Why on earth was I putting up with that? Well, I'm done with that person. I'm, I'm going to unsubscribe from their channel. I'm going to stop writing to them. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I'm going to take them, take them away from me. Take them away, Lord, and judge them. Whether they're saved or not, I have no idea. You know, whatever else, some of them might be but you still judge them. Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Right there. Why? Because they're leaven that needs to be purged out. Because if you don't, the malice and wickedness that comes from a fornicator is going to mess you up and it's going to destroy your standards. I hope that's been a challenge to you. And uh, we will see you in the next study. Thank you for watching.